Hey everybody, welcome back to marketing. I hope you're doing well out there. In our video today, we're going to be taking a look at a topic where we kind of have a little bit of psychology and marketing colliding with one another. We're gonna take a look at consumer behavior, the whole theory behind how people end up deciding what to buy. Now, obviously, if you're a marketer, you're very interested in that whole thought process because if I understand how a consumer makes a decision, I'm in a better position to kind of maybe, I don't want to say manipulate, but maybe nudge them in a certain direction I want them to go. So our goal today, learn about consumer behavior and also what it, the decision-making process is that we follow as a consumer. We'll begin with a little trip to the Kroger. And uh, I do the grocery shopping here at the Martin House from time to time. And sometimes that involves me taking a list of items and going to the market to pick them up to Kroger. And I'll give you an example. I, I hit the olive oil aisle the other day to pick up olive oil. And uh, I don't know much about olive oil. So I get to Kroger and I'm looking at what you're seeing right here. Uh, I didn't count them, but there's easily more than a dozen different types of olive oil. So how do I pick? Do I just look for the cheapest one? Do I look for the one with the most creative label? The most different uh, shape of the container it comes in? A glass bottle? A plastic bottle? I know nothing. I'm going in blind here. So I had to go through a thought process. Well, which one do I pick? It took a little decision making there. And then as I continue along throughout Kroger, and they've got me kind of looking for groceries like they're trinkets in a video game because they do the buy five, get $5 off promotion or buy 10, get $10 off promotion where you actually have to go and find certain items that are on sale and they're labeled a certain way. And then you've got to get five of them. I bought things I didn't even really need just to get five for five, just to save those extra four or five bucks there. So that took a while at the grocery store to find that. And then I was, as I was kind of walking through the store, I come along something that I've never seen before. Going through the condiment aisle, and I saw new hot sauces. I'm a hot sauce guy. And uh, specifically, I, I'm a big Tallulah guy. I like Tabasco, all right. Um, but I'm always putting hot sauce on pretty much everything I eat. And, and this is my jam right here, Tallulah green pepper. But I was walking through Kroger, and I saw right there a, a new hot sauce jalapeno tomatillo uh, that, that sounds good i didn't even look at the price i just grabbed it and threw it in my cart you know, like three or four bucks or whatever didn't even think of it just grabbed it and, and illogical i already have something i really like why would i get something else who knows so as i look at the decisions that i had to make at the kroger none of them were very high involvement None of them had very many long-term ramifications. None of them really had any more risk than a couple of bucks. But it brings up a lot of interesting questions. Why do we pick one brand over another? When I'm standing there looking at the olive oil aisle, or maybe you're standing there looking at the toothpaste aisle, what makes us reach for one particular product over another one? And why do we make impulse buys with very little thought but we carefully scrutinize other purchases. I walked around Kroger for 20 minutes trying to find five things to get for the five for five promotion. I grabbed that thing of hot sauce and threw it in my cart with no thought whatsoever. So even if I saved four or five bucks in looking for the five for five things, I just wasted that five bucks by grabbing something and throwing it in my cart. Makes no sense. And then finally, how does everything end up in your cart? The thought process that go into it, sometimes we're just on autopilot. We grab something that we've always grabbed, maybe like Kraft macaroni and cheese. We throw it in our cart and we move on. So consumer behavior is all of that. The process through which our decisions happen when we buy something. Okay, and your book says the process through which the ultimate buyer or the household consumer makes a purchase decision. And I'm going to walk you through another example that I have recently. I bought a new office chair. And I'm going to kind of walk you through that using our decision-making process the book lies out for us. So here it is. According to the book, in most every marketing book you look at and consumer behavior book, consumers go through a six-step process when they make a buying decision. Sometimes all these steps just kind of happen automatically like that. Sometimes we spend a lot of time on one step. And then we skip over the others. 
Sometimes you do the steps out of order. But the idea is, for the most part, if you're a consumer, you're doing a thought process that normally mirrors what we're looking at right here. There's a problem recognition. There's a gap between where I want to be in life and where I'm at right now. And where I, what I want from the world and where I am. There's a gap. There's a problem. And the whole process begins with you thinking, I want to fix this problem. I want to bridge the gap from where I am to where I want to be. It could be something as simple as I'm hungry. That's a problem. I need to fix it. I'm going to head to Taco Bell and fix that problem right now. Okay? So problem recognition. The consumer realizes there is a gap between their ideal state and where they're beginning from. So that sets everything into motion. The next step right here is an info search. And this happens both internally, in your mind, and externally. Internally is all your built-up experiences as a consumer. I'm hungry. I think I'm going to go to Taco Bell. What are all my experiences with Taco Bell? Does Taco Bell satisfy my hunger? Do they have food I like? I remember the different things that I've eaten there in the past. That's an internal information search. How you feel about different brands, how you feel about different products. You go through that internally. And then if you don't have enough information through your internal search, you begin to look elsewhere. You look externally. Maybe you look at product reviews. Maybe you go to the internet and look up websites and menus and different things like that to figure out more information. Maybe you poll other people. You talk to friends and family and things like that. So depending on how big of a purchase it is, kind of dictates how long you're going to spend in step two right there. If I'm talking about a $3 bottle of hot sauce, I'm not going to spend three days looking at internet reviews to try to pick out the best one. It's three bucks. I'm just going to buy it and try it. If I'm talking about a vehicle, maybe I'm going to buy an electric car like a Tesla that I've never driven before, don't know anybody that has them, I'm going to have to do a lot more research before I plop down 50,000 bucks. That's stage number two. In part three, we have the evaluation of alternatives. We come up with a, what we call an evoked set of options of different things that are under consideration. The evoked set are all the products that I'm considering buying. I've narrowed it down. And then I evaluate them relative to one another. And the, probably in that step, maybe you're doing some more information search right there too. And some of these steps kind of bleed into one another, okay? And we don't really just do them all checking off boxes in isolation one to the next one. But we have an evaluation of the alternatives. And then once we've made that evaluation, we decide to buy. Our purchase decision not only includes where to buy, but what to buy. Both of those. What am I going to buy and where am I going to get it and how am I going to get it delivered to me? Where am I going to pick it up? All that is involved in our purchase decision. The actual act of saying, okay, this is what I'm going to go with and how I'm going to buy it. And then we actually buy it. We go to the store, we go online, whatever the case might be, and we pull the trigger and we actually make a buying uh, action. And again, these two kind of maybe bleed into one another. And then after we have the product in our hands, we have a post-purchase evaluation. We kind of go back through our thought process mentally and say, okay, these are the steps that are led me to buy this product. Am I happy with it? Would I buy it again? What's my overall impression of what I bought? And did I make the right decision? And we have something in that last phase right there uh, called buyer's remorse. And sometimes, especially with a big ticket item, and maybe a laptop computer, a vehicle, you know, maybe you sign a lease on an apartment, whatever the case might be, where you think, man, should I have done that? I'm feeling a little bit antsy, feeling a little bit anxious. I don't know if I should have made that. Did I make a good decision? Generally speaking, the bigger the purchase, the higher the dollar amount, the more likely those feelings are to set in and that buyer's remorse. So that's our six step process. On a, a simple thing like a bottle of hot sauce or a bag of candy or a, you know, a 99 cent pop at the gas station, you probably don't go through that formally. We kind of make those decisions subconsciously in our brain without formally going through these steps. The bigger the purchase, the more likely it is that we go through them. So as a marketer, this is very important because a marketer wants to know, how can I influence every part of that process? Maybe it's running an advertisement to make the consumer believe 
there's a gap in their life where they didn't recognize one before. I've got a cell phone, but maybe Apple can convince me to go out and buy one of their newer phones by showing me new features. I didn't recognize there was a problem until I saw that advertisement. Or maybe they can manipulate the kind of information that I see. Maybe they can put certain ads on my Facebook feed so they can make sure that I click on it to get more information from them. All the way through here, there's different ways that marketers can kind of push us in a certain direction. So I'm gonna talk about my old office chair. Uh, this is the old battle chair right there. Seven or eight years old, it started falling apart. The fake leather started cracking off and it just basically, uh, it was embarrassing to even sit on. And videos, I would try to cover up the chair so nobody could see what, see what I was sitting on there because it looked so awful. So a couple weeks ago, I said, you know what? It's time. I'm gonna get a new office chair for my home office here in Wilmington. So I start down the path. I go into the consumer decision-making process here. Uh, and I start looking for office chairs. And when I started looking for office chairs on the internet, I started seeing ads form everywhere. I go to the Cincinnati newspaper to read the news and I would see at the top an ad for office chairs. And I went, well, why did I see that? I clicked on it. This ad is based on visits to advertisers' websites. And they started showing me ads of office chairs because I went somewhere else on the internet and looked at them. So uh, starting already, marketers are trying to put information in front of me to influence my decision-making process here. The second I typed in office chair into Google, that ball is rolling. So I'm gonna begin thinking after I've made that decision to buy a new chair and I've recognized that gap and the problem, I start thinking about information. What do I already know? Well, here's what I know about office chairs and it's not very much. I know that the one I had before was a piece of junk and the fake leather cracked, and I don't want a chair that has fake leather. I know I can't afford a chair that has real leather. So that narrows down my options right there. I have no brand loyalty for office furniture. You know, I'm, I'm a Pepsi guy, I like Mountain Dew. I'm brand loyal there. I'm a Toyota driver, I buy Toyotas. I'm, I might be brand loyal there, but I have no brand loyalty to an office chair. I don't even know what the brands are. And then finally, I have no brand knowledge for office furniture. Yeah, so I'm coming into this with a, a blank slate perspective. So that was what I went through internally. So I go to the internet and continue my search and try to get external information. I look up reviews. I go to uh, Google. I, I Google office care reviews. And bam, I get a, a link from CNET. And you can see all these different office chairs that they recommend with a caveat. Right here's the caveat at the top. The editors pick the products. When you buy through our links, we may get a commission. Ah, and so even that external process is being influenced by marketers because they will give reviewers free chairs. They'll give influencers a free chair to review and the influencer will go on YouTube and say, oh, this chair is the best chair ever. It cured my lumbar problems. I can sit in it 27 hours a day and my butt doesn't get tired. It's, it's wonderful, buy seven of them. And people have a hard time seeing that they're basically watching an advertisement. They think that's an unbiased product review, but it hardly ever is on the internet. Uh, so right here's a great example of a marketer trying to push me a certain direction towards a chair. Even if you think it's a regular website, well, CNET, that's an unbiased opinion. Well, not really, because they're getting money every time somebody buys one of these. So I go to Amazon, and I type in office chairs, and I look, and here comes all these different office chairs, uh, straight from China, no brand names, no really way to distinguish them except for what they look like, and maybe the consumer reviews. And I go through, and I look at some of the reviews on the chairs. Again, you gotta take all that with a grain of salt. Uh, some of these people are getting the chairs for free. Some of them are basically fake reviews that are put up by the seller of the product to influence people into buying them. And then Amazon has their own little ways to nudge me here too. You can see where it says best seller on these. You can see there's one with a coupon and they maybe can entice me with free shipping if I'm a Prime member. So all kinds of things at work here. So I start going through some of these chairs and I narrow it down. 
my evaluation of alternatives, I narrowed it down to two options here. The Coley Mid-Back Mesh Office Chair and then the Amazon Basics. Like I said, I didn't want leather or fake leather. So I kind of arrived at these two right here. One was 80 and one was a little more than 60 bucks. So that is my evoked set. I had two options here. And one thing I kind of want to point out here is I showed you that six step process. And a lot of uh, researchers kind of assume that people are, I don't know, um, logical all the time. But people aren't logical all the time. And this is a great example because when I made my decision, I didn't really base it off of the reviews so much. Uh, the coupon was nice. One of the reasons I made my decision, I ended up going with the colleagues because I don't like Amazon. I, I think Amazon's, a, and I'm going to get political or anything, I, I just don't like their business practices. I don't like the way they treat their employees in the warehouses from the stories I've heard. Uh, and the way they've taken advantage of some of their drivers and the subcontractors that they have there. Uh, and it just makes me uncomfortable to continue doing business with one of the richest people in the world when they do all that stuff. So I bought it from Amazon, but I didn't buy the Amazon chair. And the only reason I bought it from Amazon, if you'll notice how much I paid right here, I paid zero because I use credit card points. So that was basically my framing criteria for the entire shopping process was one, I was going to buy it off Amazon so I could use my credit card points and not have to pay cash out of my pocket. And two, I didn't want to buy anything Amazon branded. So that's kind of how I ended up buying the chair that I bought. And that's not really part of the formal decision making process, those biases that kind of leaked in there. So at the end here in a second, we'll talk about influences that kind of creep in that also lead us to our decision. So there's my chair. You can see the beauty right here. It's sturdy, it's comfortable. I am very happy with my purchase one month later. It's a chair, you know. <laughs> um, I gotta uh, talk about marketers trying to have their hand in every part of the decision-making process. It also happens after the purchase, evalu uh, purchase is made. In the evaluation process, I got an email from Amazon saying, hey, come back to Amazon, review your chair, maybe buy some more stuff. That would be cool. So it's an interesting question. As a consumer, I like my chair. I'm totally happy with it. I made a fine decision, I think. But who exactly am I pleased with? I don't know who the heck made this chair. I, don't, I can't remember the brand name without looking at the receipt or where I bought it. It came from a box from China with no branding on it. There's no branding on the chair itself. All that was in the box was the chair and one page of instructions on how to put it together with a second page from some random people thanking me for buying it and telling me to email them if I had questions. That's it. So am I pleased with a company I've never heard of? I'm never ever going to look for another one of their products. Am I pleased with Amazon because they delivered it and got it to me on time and had it in their storefront? It's another genius thing about Amazon. And when they encourage all these third-party sellers, the third-party sellers have no name recognition whatsoever. They're completely beholden on Amazon to put their product near the top so people can buy it. So Amazon's got all the power here. Amazon has none of the risk of the, carrying the inventory, but they get all the, the brand recognition. This is a pretty good deal for them. So that six-step process, put it all together. You can see it again right there in our activity this week, you're going to have a little case where you share how you went through that process for a big ticket purchase that you've made. So be on the lookout for that. A couple more little things to uh, throw in here before we wrap up. The involvement level determines maybe how much time uh, you're going to spend in making that decision. And a lot of decisions that we make purchase-wise are routine. We go to the grocery store, we buy the same deodorant that we bought for however long. We buy the same brand of potato chip we bought for however long. Very low involvement. I don't think a lot about that. I don't look for other information and it doesn't take me long to buy, uh, to make that decision at all. And you can see we, as we move on up, the products get a little bit more expensive. Clothing, cookware, personal electronics, I'll probably spend a little bit more time researching and thinking about those. All the way up to something, the really big ticket, like an automobile, furniture, uh, the, the college that you pick. 
So marketers know that, uh, you know, uh, the maker of Crest toothpaste probably isn't going to spend billions of dollars trying to convince me from a technological standpoint that their toothpaste is better than everybody else's. Okay, they're just going to run a commercial that says, hey, dentists recommend it. Other influences to our decisions. We'll wrap up right here. Like I mentioned, it's not always cut and dry, that six-step process that brings us from recognizing a gap all the way to making a decision. We have other influences that seep in that kind of lead us along as well. It's not just what marketers put in front of us. There are other things in our personal lives that kind of also help us come to a decision. They're broken down into three categories in your book. We have social influences, we have psychological factors, and then we have situational factors. All of these influence how and what we buy. And just to kind of run through here real quick, social influence, our social class kind of sets the parameters for what we buy. Our income, uh, our gender, our race, all that kind of stuff rolled up into one. And to give you an example, using office chairs. After doing a little bit of research, I found there is a brand name for office furniture. Herman Miller. Never heard of Herman Miller before. But as I was looking, uh, came across their website, office chairs. You can see one right there. Let me just kind of look home office chairs right here. Look at the butt on that one. Long butt. That's a long butt chair. <laughs> uh, but look at it. Holy cow. A thousand bucks for a chair? That has to be the long butt chair, right? Let me see if I can find that one here. I don't know. But you see, they, they start at 500, go up to into the thousands of dollars. Holy smokes. That is well beyond my social class. I cannot afford a $2,000 office chair. I can afford a $77 office chair that I pay for with credit card points. So that's completely outside my social class. Didn't even consider that in my evoked set of options. We also have reference groups, people that we look to, to kind of, uh, like a little pat on the back when we make decisions. Our reference group kind of pat us on the back and say, you did a good job. You fit in with us. Office chair, there's not really a reference group for that. I don't have my friends coming over and looking at my office chair and saying, hey, we like you because you picked the right office chair. I mean, come on. Uh, opinion leaders, we might look to celebrities and Instagram influencers and try to follow what they're doing. Again, I don't really have an opinion leader for an office chair. And family, that's also sometimes a big social influence. Now, I, I did have to pick a chair that my wife could also sit in. Uh, so maybe he was also consulted as part of the decision. But uh, social influence, influences obviously have a pretty big impact on what we buy, especially if we're younger. A, a lot of younger people like to buy things that their friends have and like to have things that their friends have. That way they fit in. So social influence is big. Psychological factors are also big. Your book talks about Maslow's hierarchy of needs and how we make decisions based on fulfilling those needs, whether it be for comfort, safety, self-actualization, whatever the case might be. Attitudes also affect our, our purchase decisions. Like I said before, I, I have kind of a negative attitude about Amazon as a business and their ethics that they kind of demonstrate. So I try not to buy from them anymore. I dropped my Prime membership a, about a year ago haven't looked back. I've made maybe two purchases with Amazon in the past year, where I used to make two a month. And then also your self-concept, how you feel about yourself, how you view yourself. I'm perfectly comfortable viewing myself as someone that sits in a generic $70 office chair. I don't need a $1,000 office chair from Herman Miller to feel good about myself. Uh, so psychological factors in play. Then and finally, your situational factors. Sometimes our physical surroundings influence our purchase. And give me an example. I've ever been somewhere where it's, it's really crowded. Uh, maybe like right after the pandemic and you went grocery shopping and you've seen people and they got the mask on and you're like, oh my gosh. And you just throw stuff in your cart and get the heck out of there. <laughs> Sometimes your physical surroundings, if you're uncomfortable, that may lead you to more impulse decisions, may lead you just to grab something and get the heck out of there. That's why stores will sometimes try to create a very nice, welcoming, uh, comfortable environment for you to shop in. Your social surroundings, who you're with, 
can sometimes dictate what you buy. Maybe you go out on a date and you know you don't know the person very well. You go to B-dubs. You can tell I'm not very romantic. I'm at B-dubs on a date here. Um, but maybe normally I would order traditional bone-in hot wings. I don't know. I'm going to eat them up. But now I'm on a date. I don't want to do that. I got to eat something I can uh, get something I can get with a knife and a fork and eat it that way. And it's not going to make my nose run. I don't end up with hot sauce all over my face. So your social surroundings can influence what you buy as well. And just as that is an example. Also, your purchase reason why you're buying it. If you're buying it uh, because you're trying to replace something that you need. Uh, if you're buying it because you're being forced to or because uh, maybe it's a vacation thing and you don't really need it, but you want to splurge because you're treating yourself. Why are you buying something that can also lead uh, you to a certain decision? And finally, your mood. You know, some people like to shop when they're in a bad mood. It makes them feel good. They're only buying things to improve their mood. Uh, so there's all kinds of kind of outside influences outside of that six step decision making process that influence why we buy what we buy. So how about a takeaway here? A takeaway. Understanding your decision-making process. It not only makes you a better consumer, but it also helps you understand how marketers are trying to influence you because it's happening all the time all around you. And being able to take a step back and be self-aware and understand, hey, I bought this because blah, 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 it helps you kind of peel that lid off and say, oh, well, that's what the marketers are trying to do to me. And if you become a marketer, it helps you understand how to do that to people. So if you have any questions or comments, that's the end of our chapter six video. Feel free to use that information in putting together your case uh, on consumer behavior. If you have any questions, I'd love to hear from you. Reach out anytime and we'll try to take care of you. Aside from that, I'm looking forward to see uh, seeing what your all's purchases were on our consumer behavior case, and we'll see you next time for our next video.